Hey everyone, ready to brush up on those life-saving skills? Always a good idea. We're diving into the latest basic life support guidelines, focusing on adult child and infant CPR. It's foundational stuff. Absolutely critical for all of us in healthcare. Couldn't agree more. These guidelines are the bedrock of emergency care. They can really make the difference. Okay, so let's not waste any time. Let's jump right in scene safety. Always got to start there, right? Right. That's always the first step. It's all about ensuring that the environment is safe for both the rescuer and the patient. Makes perfect sense. Can't help anyone if we become victims ourselves. So we've confirmed a safe scene. What's next? How do we quickly recognize if someone's in cardiac arrest? Well, it all comes down to a rapid assessment. We're checking if the person is responsive, you know, tap their shoulder, shout, see if they react, and then we're looking for normal breathing. Not just gasping. Exactly. Not just gasping. We need to see consistent chest rise and fall. Okay, got it. Yeah. So no response and no normal breathing, then what? Then we quickly check for a pulse. Don't spend more than 10 seconds on this. 10 seconds. That's so fast. It is. Ideally, you should be able to assess responsiveness, breathing, and pulse in under 10 seconds. Wow. Okay, so no pulse means... Cardiac arrest. We got to move fast. Okay, cardiac arrest confirmed. Mm. What do we do? All right, so let's say you're alone with an adult who just collapsed in that case. You need to call for help and get an automated external defibrillator. Before starting CPR. Exactly. Do no. those two things before you start CPR. Interesting. Is it the same for children and infants? There are a few nuances there. If you see a child or infant collapse, you follow the same steps as for an adult. But if you didn't witness the collapse, you do two minutes of CPR first, then call for help and get that AED. So the order changes a bit depending on age and whether we saw it happen. That's important to remember. Now, what about those CPR ratios? Things get a little tricky there, don't they? You're right. There are different ratios depending on the age and the number of rescuers. Let's assume there's no advanced airway in place. Okay. No advanced airway. Right. So if for an adult or adolescent, whether it's one rescuer or two, the ratio is 30 compressions to two breaths, and that's the same ratio for a child or infant with one rescuer. 30 compressions, two breaths. Got it. What if there are two or more rescuers for a child or infant? Then it shifts to 15 compressions to two breaths, so that faster pace makes CPR more efficient when you have a team. Okay, so faster compressions, quicker breaths when there are more hands on deck makes sense. What about those situations where an advanced airway is involved? Ah, uh, yes. If there's an advanced airway in place, we switch gears. We do continuous compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute, and we give one breath every six seconds. So the advanced airway changes things quite a bit. Now let's talk about the force we use for compressions. How hard are we pushing here? Compression depth and rate are a key aim for a consistent rhythm of 100 to 120 compressions per minute for everyone. Adults, children, infants, and for adults, you'll need at least two inches of depth, but don't go beyond 2.4 inches. How about for the little ones, children, and infants? With children and infants, you're aiming for about one-third of their chest's front-to-back diameter, which translates to roughly two inches for a child and one and a half inches for an infant. Okay, so we've covered the rate and the depth. Now let's talk about hand placement. Where exactly are we pushing on the chest? For adults and larger children, you'll use two hands placed on the lower half of the breastbone if it's a smaller child. One hand might be enough. And for infants, they're so tiny. Infants get special treatment. If you're the only rescuer, you'll use two fingers positioned in the center of the chest just below the nipple line. What if there are two rescuers for an infant? Does that change things? Yes. When you have two rescuers for an infant, you'll use the two thumb encircling hands technique. Two thumb encircling hands. Yeah. Picture this. You gently cup the infant's chest with your hands and use your thumbs to provide those rhythmic compressions. I can see the two thumbs encircling the chest gently but firmly pumping. Okay. So we are pushing down with the right force and rhythm. Mm -hmm. What happens next? It's essential to allow the chest to fully recoil after each compression. Let the chest come all the way back up before the next compression. Why is that full recoil so important? Think of it like this. When you compress the chest, you're squeezing the heart and pushing blood out to the body. Full recoil allows the heart to refill with blood before the next squeeze. It's essential for effective circulation. It makes sense. Like filling a cup, you have to empty it before you can refill it. So we push down, release completely, and repeat. Exactly. And we want to keep interruptions to an absolute minimum, ideally less than 10 seconds. A smooth and steady rhythm is the goal. Got no leaning, lingering on the chest. Just push, release, and repeat. All right. We've discussed safety, recognizing cardiac arrest, getting help CPR ratios, proper compressions, and the importance of full recoil. What's next on our list? So next up, minimizing interruptions during CPR. Okay, so what exactly counts as an interruption? 
Well, any pause in chest compressions is considered an interruption, so this could include checking for a pulse switching rescuers or even taking a moment to catch your breath. So every time we stop compressions, we're essentially disrupting blood flow to the brain and other vital organs. Precisely. And that's why we want to keep those interruptions to an absolute minimum, less than 10 seconds, if at all possible. 10 seconds, that's not a lot of time. How do we ensure we keep interruptions that short? Teamwork and coordination are key if you're working with a partner. Practice those smooth transitions, coordinate switching positions, and giving breaths. What if you're alone and have to handle everything yourself? If you're flying solo, so to speak, then you really need to minimize the time spent on those non-compression tasks. Mm -hmm. Things like checking the pulse, setting up the AED every second counts. This really highlights just how many crucial details there are in CPR. It's a lot to keep in mind. It is, and those details can have a big impact. You know, they can really boost the effectiveness of CPR and ultimately improve the patient's chances of survival. So to recap, minimizing interruptions is key. Key pauses and compressions under 10 seconds if possible. If working with a partner, develop a system for switching roles quickly. And if you're alone, be super efficient with every task. That way you're ensuring maximum time spent on those compressions. Excellent summary. Now let's shift gears and talk about the Automated External Defibrillator, or AED. This device can really be a lifesaver during cardiac arrest. Absolutely. I'm eager to learn more about AEDs. Well, think of an AED as a portable device that analyzes the heart's rhythm and can deliver an electrical shock if necessary. So it's like a mini heart starter. Yes, and the beauty of an AED is that anyone can use it. It's designed to be used even by those without extensive medical training. That's amazing. How does it work? AEDs are surprisingly user-friendly. You turn it on and it provides voice prompts to guide you through every step. It literally talks you through it. It does. It instructs you to attach pads to the patient's chest. Then it analyzes the heart rhythm and determines whether a shock is needed. What if a shock is required? If a shock is needed, the device will tell you to stand clear and then it delivers the shock automatically. Wow. So it removes the guesswork. We don't have to decide whether or not to shock the patient. Exactly. The AED takes care of that. It analyzes the rhythm and takes appropriate action, a powerful tool that can really tip the scales in the patient's favor. So when should we use an AED? As soon as possible. If someone collapses and is showing no signs of life, grab the AED right away. We're talking unresponsive, not breathing, no pulse. Should we use it even before starting CPR? Ideally, someone else would grab the AED while you initiate CPR, but if you're alone, then yes, retrieve the AED first. So the AED is really a top priority in cardiac arrest. Without a doubt, it has the potential to save lives. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. Scene safety, recognizing cardiac arrest, calling for help, CPR ratios, compression techniques, minimizing interruptions, and now the AED. Is there anything else we need to touch on? I think we hit the essentials, but it's important to remember that basic life support guidelines are always evolving. Those recommendations can change as new research comes out. That makes sense. So it sounds like staying up to date is really key. Absolutely. The best way to do that is through certified basic life support courses. Practice those skills regularly. Never become complacent. Great advice. Well, to all our listeners out there, thank you so much for joining us on this deep dive into basic life support. We hope you found this episode helpful and informative. Absolutely. Knowledge is power. And when it comes to saving lives, every second counts. So stay prepared, stay confident, and never underestimate your ability to make a difference. That's a wrap, everyone. Until next time, stay safe and stay informed. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.